Good evening, this is John Milburn for Central Queensland University. This is Laws 11057, Introduction to Law. We're into week eight. Week eight is based around chapter 11 of your text. Your text um, uh, deals with theories of law and justice. The material in the text is very well written. It's comprehensive and I don't intend to take you through it point by point. I'll leave you to read the material and um, as I think I've mentioned to you in the past, I believe that you can read the material that's presented to you just as intelligently as I or other um, unit coordinators, lecturers can do. I don't see much point in rehashing the material. But what I'd like to do is identify some practical aspects of the way in which law and justice operates in um, both university studies levels and in practice as a solicitor or a barrister. So firstly, dealing with the issues of law and justice in a practical asp uh, aspect as a student. And the topic that I'd like to highlight is that of plagiarism and collaboration. Firstly, has anyone done any research through the university website in relation to issues to do with plagiarism, student misconduct and collaboration generally? Feel free to unmute your microphone or to use the chat facility. In other words, if you wanted to know through, yes, Michael. So I was going to say, didn't we? You give us a case about. Can you hear me there, Michael? Sorry. Sorry, I'm just not getting any audio coming through. Can others hear Michael? You can. Sorry, my apologies. If you could just bear with me, I'll just check um, my speaker system because I'm just not hearing it. Now I should be right. Sorry, Michael. No, I'm still not hearing anything. My apologies. Right. I heard, didn't you oh. go over, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can, loud and clear, thank you. Uh, didn't we go over the case where there was a plagiarism that he took the, he got charged for plagiarism, was gonna get kicked out of the university, then he went to court about clarification of plagiarism or just, what's the word? Laziness, I guess, it's not the word I'm looking for, but I know starting to read other things. And you're probably talking about the Humsey Hancock decision. That's the one. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. sure. And I, um, so that is, that is true. So if you're looking for material about plagiarism and collaboration as against collusion, um, you would look to case law. And the Humsey Hancock uh, decision is, is a very good one. So it was re Humsey hyphen Han Hancock. It wasn't Humsey against Hancock. So it's just a hyphenated surname. So where else would you look if you want specific information about collaboration and plagiarism, student misconduct generally, for Central Queensland University. Any further thoughts? Okay, so what I'd um, recommend that you do is the ALC, thank you, Ben. Um, I would have a look at the university policies in that regard. I'm going to attempt to share the screen. I'm working off my laptop, so it's only the one screen, um, but I'll share that um, shortly and um, we'll have a look at some of the, what, the place where I think you can look at uh, finding that information. So hopefully you can see a picture of a beach. Is that coming up on your screen? That's um, not yet. Not yet. Oh, yeah, it is now. Yep. All right. So that's a picture of um, uh, the Black Beach at Vik in Iceland. So what we'll do is we'll look at um, CQU policies. And the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is that if we're going to talk about the practice of law, justice, and the theory behind it, we need to broaden our horizons in terms of legal research skills. So dealing specifically with the issue of plagiarism, academic misconduct, collusion versus collaboration, I draw your attention to the Central Queensland University policy page. This is something that you should consider for a wide range of materials. You'll see here that I've pre-typed in the word plagiarism, hit the search button 
and it's come up with a number of results. Now, you should be able to access the policies through your own login page. If you can't, please um, make note on Ucrew and we'll work together towards um, making sure that you can all access the policy information. And it's not just policies generally, there's a lot of other information. So policies, I've typed in plagiarism and you'll see that it's come up with um, 15 search results. The material that you should probably look at, I would suggest is academic misconduct procedures and student misconduct policy, but there may be others. And you'll see that the policies apply not just to students, but to academics as well. So um, if you have any questions about that, please ask through Ucrew. But in the meantime, I would suggest that you look at that uh, policy document. All right, now there's a few comments coming through on the um, um, chat facility. Some about the beach. It's quite amazing beach. All right, are there any questions about collusion, plagiarism, where you should look to find that basic information? Would anyone suggest somewhere beyond looking at um, material on the CQU policy or through the court's websites for information about collusion and plagiarism? Okay, maybe keep that in mind as a private research policy. But um, if you haven't already completed your toolkit, you might want to touch on that as an issue of ensuring that what you pre present is consistent with your obligations as a student and ensure that you have um, provided material that conforms with academic uh, uh, conduct requirements. Now, expanding that a little further, but still on the general theme of um, information about the theory of law and the practice of law in a, a practical sense, let's think about what it means to be a practitioner. So as a solicitor or a barrister, say in Queensland, is there a resource available to you which will provide you with information about the rules relating to practice? Has anyone come across any material? Maybe the Law Society? Yes, so the Queensland Law Society says, Deb, the Law Society says, Diane, I agree with that. And the Queensland Law Society is relevant to which branch of the profession in Queensland? It's a load of, yes, Diane? Oh, I was just gonna say lawyers and barristers, isn't it? Is that what you're meaning? Yeah, we're getting close and uh, there's an issue about terminology there. But, um, it is to do with solicitors. Alison is correct. And the Queensland Law Society is the representative body for Queensland solicitors. Does anyone know the representative body for um, barristers in Queensland? Ma uh, Mary says rules for solicitors and barristers. Yes, and I'm working towards that. The bar association? Bar association of Queensland, yes. Okay, so if we're talking about the practice of law in Queensland um, from the perspective of access to justice, theories of laws, etc., the point that I'm, I guess I'm trying to make is that you need to consider the um, material which is available to you and the general public uh, through the representative bodies of both the Queensland Law Society and the Bar Association of Queensland. Now, when you're practising as a lawyer, particularly as a solicitor, the issue of undertakings is very important. I did prepare a couple of years ago a video relating to conduct rules and undertakings, what it means and uh, how it can be used, um, what are the differences between undertakings given directly by a practitioner as opposed to an undertaking given by a practitioner on behalf of a client, some of the rules that relate to sanction and where you look to find these things. Now, Mary's given us a hint in terms of where you would look for information about what is involved in giving an undertaking by a solicitor and what is involved in um, breaching those obligations. 
So now, just again, to broaden your research skills, if you're thinking about the obligations imposed on a solicitor when giving an undertaking or the sanction for breaching an undertaking, where would you look for information about that? Thoughts? Isn't that like the Legal Practitioner Board? Yes, and uh, that I don't, don't know the name in Western Australia. Michael, you're in Western Australia, aren't you? Yeah, that's what it is. It's the Legal Practitioners Board over yeah. here. Okay. All right. So that sounds as though it would be the counterpart of the Queensland Law Society. Mary says the Law Society website has information, and I agree with that. So do have a look, if you can, at the video that I prepared about undertakings. If I haven't included on Moodle, please remind me through you crew and I'll um, pro provide you with a link to that. But what you need to consider are the practice rules, both for solicitors and barristers in Queensland. And in Queensland, we need to consider um, the ethics centre material. We'll talk more about ethics in the next few weeks, but um, as a an introduction to that, given that the material this week is quite light in terms of um, content, it's, it, there's not a lot of reading, I would suggest that you start looking at the Queensland Law Society website, particularly look at the Ethics Centre material and have a look at the Bar Association. Now, the material that you'll find is based on, if you like, guiding rules of conduct for lawyers in Queensland. What are those guiding rules of conduct? What are they called? And um, do we have, and I suppose the answer is yes, we do have different ones for solicitors and barristers. Is it just a code of conduct? No, it's not called a code of conduct. Okay. It's along those lines, yes. So for Queensland solicitors, have a look at the Australian Solicitors Conduct Rules the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules from 2012, which have been adopted in Queensland. And for the Bar Association, we look at the what's called the Barrister's Rule, um, which was modified, as I recall, last year in 2017, or it might have been 2016, sorry. So make sure that you have the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules and the Barrister's Rule available as a resource. The reason I'm suggesting that is that quite often in your studies, you'll be asked to answer questions from the perspective as if you were a practitioner. It's certainly a practice that I adopt regularly. And you might see a question start by something, setting a scenario saying, well, pretend you're a first year lawyer working in a solicitor's office. You're confronted by these circumstances. What do you do? And the, the question typically will relate to issues to do with conduct and law, but also ethical obligations. And this is where you need to be sure that you know where to look to comply with your ethical obligations. So as a student, we need to be aware of plagiarism procedures, student misconduct and plagiarism policies, all of that accessible to you through the CQU website. And as a practitioner, you need to be aware of the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules or the Barrister's Rule, whether you're a solicitor or barrister, respectively. And quite often, when it comes to these sorts of um, answers in a question, you would uh, refer to both the Conduct Rules for Solicitors and for Barristers. Um, yes, and Mary has made the, the point correctly that the Uniform Conduct Practice and CPD Rules for Solicitors has been adopted in many states. So thank you very much. And I'd really like to share some information about that on UCRU, if you have any information. So all of this is in the context of the practice of law and justice in a, in a, in a hands-on sense. So the example that I want to highlight in terms of solicitor's conduct particularly relates to the issue of undertakings. So we've probably, you probably know now where to look if you want some information about undertakings, where would be the first reference point if you're thinking about the way in which solicitors 
use undertakings in practice in Queensland. All right, so we'd look at the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, which have been adopted by the Law Society in Queensland. And when you look at those rules, say in relation to the issue of undertakings, you might look at rule three and you might look at rule six. Um, so rule three provides a general policy statement that in practicing as a solicitor in Queensland, and the same thing applies as a barrister, the duty that you have, which is paramount, is to the court and the administration of justice. And have a look at rule four also, that provides generally about fundamental duties of honesty and integrity. So that's the overriding rule. That's the basis upon which you must practice. You'll note that your obligation to the court and the administration of justice is above the obligation that you have to your client or to your employer. Now, undertakings, rule six. You must be very careful before you even think about giving an undertaking, particularly if it's an undertaking by you personally as a practitioner. An undertaking is a commitment by you to do a certain thing. <clears throat> what happens if a solicitor gives an undertaking and fails to follow through with that undertaking? Any thoughts? He's legally bound. Legally bound, absolutely. And what's the sanction, Michael? Oh, it's passing that one. No, that's right. Mary says because you must comply or there are consequences, fines, even disbarment. And that's true. You can be struck off as a result of breaching an undertaking. Okay, let's assume that we have this scenario. In a conveyancing matter, there's an undertaking given by a solicitor to pay an amount of money once a certain event uh, occurs. Let's say a land tax um, account is going to uh, be sent um, by um, uh, and received, and the solicitor gives an undertaking to pay that land tax amount uh, at some stage in the future. What happens if the solicitor fails to do that? Well, fines or disbarment, says Mary, and I agree with that. What if the solicitor gave that undertaking based on a promise by a client to pay that money and the, the solicitor says, look, I'm sorry, I can't fulfill that obligation, that undertaking because the client failed to provide me with the $2,000 that I need to pay that. Mary correctly says the solicitor must pay, the solicitor is still responsible. And that's absolutely correct. So when you give an undertaking, um, make sure that you can fulfil it or be prepared to fulfil it, otherwise you will meet the consequences. What that means is that you need to be very careful about giving undertakings in circumstances where you are dependent upon a third party to do something. So let's say, for example, that you give an undertaking to provide a, a certificate of title in paper form at a certain event. Well, you're relying on other things to occur or the concurrence of agencies to produce that document and you must be very careful about giving a blanket undertaking that you will uh, provide something if you are relying on others to do something as part of that process. One thing that you must be aware of is the difference between an undertaking by a solicitor and an undertaking by a solicitor on behalf of a client. What's the difference, do you think? The, the client may have provided the instructions to under, to provide the undertaking, so it's on their, they're responsible if, um, if the undertaking isn't met. That's it, yes. And yep, uh, Michael comments would show that. Yep, thank you, Diane, I agree with that. And Michael has a similar answer, you're acting on behalf of the client. So adding that phrase changes the circumstance completely um, in that what you are then doing is providing an undertaking on behalf of someone else. 
and it has it's much less potent. So if you're receiving the undertaking, you need to consider the wording carefully uh, to determine how inf uh, how you will go in enforcing that document. All right, so have a look at the Queensland Law Society, the Barrister's Rule, have a, have a think about undertakings and think about how that might be used in practice. Uh, these are issues that occur regularly in a practical sense. Okay, now I've mentioned tonight briefly something about answering questions and the fact that you need to incorporate, for example, information about uh, conduct rules as part of an answer, depending on how the question is framed. In material that I provided earlier or in our previous discussion, I think we talked about legal thinking skills and legal analysis. So do you remember we talked, I think, about the way in which different words in a question that are posed of you will result in you answering that question in a different manner? So just as a refresher, and it's in your text, but if you are asked to interpret something, what does that mean and what are we testing of you if we ask you to interpret? Any thoughts? Okay. Again, this might be something in your toolkit. So what do you think of a matter? Yes. And I agree with that. I think, um, so Diane and um, Diane said, what do you think of a matter? Mary said, your critical thinking ability. Yes, so when we talk about interpretation, it's the ability to identify the surface meaning of the object of a critique. And what we're looking to test is your ability to accurately explain the meaning of terms and phrases and legal rules and the meaning of those. Mary says, your critical thinking ability and be objective. Yep. So if you're asked to interpret something as a single phrase, I would suggest that it means we are testing your ability to understand. The second type of legal analysis is, is analysis itself. So if you come across the word analyze, as part of a question that's asked of you as a student, what does that mean and how is it different to interpreting? So if the first question was interpret section you know, 17 of the Australian Consumer Law, as opposed to analyze section 17 of the Australian Consumer Law, I mean, there's, there is a difference. So Diane says, analysis is your ability to consider the matter. Any other thoughts? Okay, so analysis is your ability to identify the hidden elements and structures of the object of the critique. Put into a question, it is, can you examine the legal rule and identify the legal principle policy that informs the rule? That's what we mean by analysis. As a quick reference guide, I would suggest that analysis is where we are testing your ability to identify hidden features. So if you're asked to interpret section 17 of the Australian Consumer Law, we want, we're testing your ability to understand it. But if we ask you to analyse section 17 of the Australian Consumer Law, it is essentially a requirement for you to both interpret and go beyond that to identify hidden features relevant to that law. So analysis is a much deeper process. We're asking you to find things that aren't there and discuss those. All right, the third type of legal question that may be put to you is one requiring evaluation. So what's an evaluation and why is that different to interpretation or analysis? Evaluation, what does evaluation mean? Right, so evaluation is the ability to assess the object of the critique. Ah, that's it. Diane has got it. 
consider the matter and compare with another, with, a, with an, another matter. So your ability to assess the object of the critique by comparing the object with a set of ex explicit criteria and identifying the extent to which the subject of critique does or does not satisfy the criteria. So put into a question form, if we're asking you to evaluate something in a legal question, it is, can you assess a legal rule according to a standard or such as consistency with human rights? Evaluation, in a nutshell, is your ability to assess. I'm sorry, I've, I've jumped from analysis on to evaluation, sorry. Um, so I'll just go back to analysis. Analysis of the uh, hidden features, evaluation is your ability to assess. So if we ask you to evaluate section 17 of the Australian Consumer Law, we're looking at you going a little further, probably demonstrating that you're able to interpret it, probably your ability to anal analyze it as well, but going a little further and saying, is it consistent with some form of standard? And the standard that we would normally look to are issues to do with human rights materials. Often, if you're asked to evaluate a question, you may have to bring in something about treaties uh, or broad general principles of human rights, for example. Inference. If you're asked a question about inferring something, it's your ability to identify reasonable and justifiable conclusions about the object of the critique based on known facts, reliable evidence, or the results of the exercise of your interpretation, analysis, or evaluation skills. So inference is going even further, where you deal with interpretation, analysis, and evaluation. So put into a question, if you're asked to infer or provide an inference about something, you're being asked this, can you use the results of your interpretation analysis and evaluation of a legal rule to identify the faults in the legal rule and the way in which the law may be reformed. In a phrase, inference is your ability to draw conclusions. So you can see how each of these different types of um, analysis or critical skills and legal research skills require you to adopt a step to process. So if your question in an exam requires you to make an inference about section 17 of the Australian consumer law, you need to consider um, faults in the legal rule and ways in which that might be reformed. So Mary says, Inference is a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning. Yes. And, and go further and um, can you draw conclusions on that? All right. Explanation is your ability to effectively and persuasively communicate the results of your critical thinking to others. In a question form, can you present the results of your interpretation, analysis or and evaluation of a legal rule in order to justify your proposed legal reform. So explanation is your ability to communicate results. And the other one is self-regulation. Uh, you won't be asked a question about that. But the key point is, and something perhaps that you might include in your toolkit, is your ability to answer a legal question, either at university or practice level, um, which is dependent upon the question that's asked of you. And um, there's no point in providing an inference answer if all you've been asked to do is interpret. The point that I'm making is that it's very easy to gloss over that first word and start talking about Section 17 of the Australian Consumer Law without properly first considering what it is that the examiner is asking you to do. All right, so have a look at that. Um, refer to the new lawyer. And I think from memory it's in chapter four or week four material.
and it's all to do with critical skills and critical thinking. And the point that I'm making there is that you can't answer a question properly unless you understand what is meant by the relevant critical skill. And again, what we're looking to do is put into a practical sense how you go about describing, for example, theories of law and justice, which is chapter 11. Okay, so on that point, um, you should also consider a, um, a YouTube video by Professor, Associate Professor Scott Beatty, which deals with how to read for law students. And I just want to touch on that as well. Do, do any of you have any tips for reading material on law that you find useful for others? Because there's an awful lot of material that you need to cover. So any tips on, yes, Alison. I think um, I found reading a case for statutory interpretation much easier after watching that video. Um, and the thing that I picked up was, rather than just starting to read from start to finish, is gloss over it, skim it, look at your headings, um, or all, all the titles, and you know anything sort of relevant in that regard. And then you know highlight anything you want to come back to, and then go back and and read over it several different times and then get more in depth as you go. I think that's an excellent approach and I'm very pleased that you found that video helpful. So thank you, Alison. And I agree entirely with that approach. So another way of putting it is the helicopter view. So you'll read about that sometimes. So you're looking at, for example, the Australian consumer law and rather than immediately go to section 17, which is asked of you, in order to answer the question properly about Section 17 of the Australian Consumer Law, to do the job correctly, first you need to look at the entire piece of legislation from that helicopter view perspective. And as Alison correctly explained, you look at the headings, you look at the material generally to get a feel for it, and from then you then narrow back into the specific section that you're looking at. Deb says chocolate helps when it comes to reading, and I think that's probably right too. Um, so one tip that I have for reading material in law is to adopt a, a type of speed reading process initially, get a feel for the entire book or piece of legislation or case by trying to move through it fairly quickly, looking at headings if you've got headings, and getting a feel for it first before you start to read in detail. The other approach, which I don't subscribe to, is to commence reading in detail, a perusal if you like, from the outset and work your way from the start to the finish. I think it's much better to adopt that broad approach first, perhaps highlight some headings, get a feel for it, and then go back into perusal or detailed reading mode. Everyone will be different. And the reason I'm highlighting this is that when it comes to um, putting these things in practice, you need to have a procedure that works for you. And these are things that will probably find their way into your toolkit in terms of your approach. Uh, just because I approach certain things in a, in, a, in a manner doesn't make it right, um, but it's what works for me. I guess Alison did uh, correctly identify statutory interpretation principles. I will say this as something which is clearly correct, and that is that you must adopt um, a view of reading certain provisions in an act from the perspective of the entire context of the law and the act as a whole. So in that sense, having that helicopter view is really for legislation at least, a mandatory requirement before you drill down and read the section. Now, I hope this isn't all too um, obscure. I'm really trying to make this a practical session so that um, you can use this for your toolkit, but also answering questions in law generally and in practice. Are there any questions or comments? Does anyone have an alternate approach? Any tips, hints, things that they found works for them? Alison's given us a contribution. Thank you for that. Any others? <laughs> 
All right. So uh, just keep that in mind in terms of research uh, skills. And I guess one of the themes for tonight is within the context of the theories of justice and law, we've been talking about ethics and the ethics as they apply in practice, but also ethics as they apply to research. Um, reading others' interpretations that are authorities, yes, I agree with that, Mary, is a good approach as well. What you'll see often with my comments about material that you present to me is that you should reference your material um, by giving an indication of the original source. Sometimes people don't go far enough, sometimes people go too far, and I'll try to provide you with feedback about your exact style in the material that you present to me uh, for assessment. But otherwise, look at what others have done in terms of case law or uh, legal material, textbooks, etc., and and perhaps identify and follow that approach that uh, others have used before you, before you. Okay, so how did you go with reading chapter 11? All pretty straightforward, dealing with being realistic. All good, Mary said yes, that's fine. All right, so one of the first points in that chapter, I think from memory was still reading, yep, is judicial activism. So what is, what's meant by judicial activism? You see reference to judicial activism quite often in university papers. So statutory interpretation, yes, to a degree, but it's a bit broader than that. Can you give me an example of judicial activism in practice? Marbo, thank you, Craig. That's exactly what I was looking for. I think that's the outstanding example of judicial activism. And in that case, in the Marbo decision, of course, the High Court recognised the, ex the existence of native title. Ah, Mary says the resource for the week, Kirby's address in 2005. Thank you. That's excellent. So judicial activism, as the name suggests, involves the judiciary doing something. Activism meaning taking proactive action to do something. And it is essentially where a judge, or more likely several judges in the High Court, reform the law. And by reforming the law, we're talking about reforming a law that is said to be unjust or obsolete or defective. Usually, laws are made by Parliament, but judicial activism is the exception where the courts make a law um, by way of a reformation. Marbo's an example where it was the High Court that recognised the existence of native title, not Parliament. Parliament followed the following year, but didn't initiate the process. Now, judicial activism is not without its critics. Can anyone identify what might be wrong about judges essentially creating laws through ju judicial activism? Personal opinions, yes, I agree with that. And that was Diane's response. Thank you, Diane. Religious beliefs, says Craig. Yes. So there may be some element. Self-benefit, says Michael. Some are very conservative. Yes, says Mary. So there's a whole range of things that you might put forward as being reasons why judicial activism is inappropriate. So in your text, you might read about judicial activism working retrospectively. Some commentators say that judges are second-rate lawmakers. And from a general perspective, I think there's an argument to say that it offends the principle of separation of powers in that Parliament should make laws, not, not the courts, who are there to interpret the laws and to deal with issues of dispute about those laws. Okay, so think about judicial activism in the context of theories of justice and the law. Um, when you're reading about theories of the law, 
you'll read often about the rule of law. So I think that you should have some section devoted for providing definitions about different phrases or words that you come across um, in law. And just on that point of judicial activism, Mary adds that um, some laws are unjust, so they need to uh, be put into current societal views and uh, be seen to be in the context of current views. So thank you for that, Mary. So the rule of law is part of our legal theory. It underpins our legal professional ethics. So again, I'm tying tonight's material into legal ethics that we will deal with in more detail later. So when we talk about the rule of law, we're talking about big picture material. We're talking about political accountability, and we're talking about general principles such as uh, rules against arbitrary detention, lack of due process, and protection of institutions like trial by jury. And that's what we mean by the rule of law. It's, if you like, an overarching obligation imposed on our politicians, parliamentarians, to make law that are consistent uh, to make specific laws that are consistent with our general rule of law. So if you're attacking a piece of legislation or you're advancing an argument, one thing you can attempt to do is to argue that um, the rule of law is offended as a result of certain things within legislation. Probably mostly arguments for the High Court, but can be used in other courts as well. Okay, so hopefully by now, and I'll wrap up fairly soon, but hopefully by now you're identifying specific ways of undertaking legal research that works for you. Um, I'm not sure if I've actually provided this material, but Harvard University provide a guide which um, provides some benefit in that regard, and I'll post that on you, Crew. When you do your toolkit, I want you to work towards something that I will implement um, soon, probably in week 10, and that is a brainstorming exercise. So just to introduce that, what I mean by this brainstorming exercise is to challenge you by putting forward different scenarios and asking you, if you were in practice, how would you go about providing assistance to a client in a general or fairly, if I can use the term, holistic sense? For example, um, if you're involved in advising a person who wants to pursue a debt in circumstances where the debt is owed by, say, their child, will your advice be different to that where the debt is owed by a commercial customer who has failed to pay their bill in the ordinary course? And looking at the matter holistically, the first thing that might come to your mind is, well, do you really want to sue your son or daughter or would you like to consider things like mediation? And Mary quite rightly says it depends on what the client wants and I agree entirely with that. But remember, of course, that your role is to provide appropriate options for your client to consider. And what we don't want is a situation where having embarked on litigation, which has been very um, emotionally draining, and expensive, the client then says to you, I wish you'd told me or uh, about mediation because in hindsight, that would have been a better option for me. So best to cover yourself and provide the client with plenty of alternatives by considering this, a wide range of different um, methods of resolving a dispute uh, from the outset. So Mary said dispute resolution. So when I talk about brainstorming and I talk about this holistic advice, what I'm really do, looking to do is challenge you to think about different ways to resolve a dispute or advise a client to resolve a dispute without necessarily thinking this is going to litigation. The difference between that approach and the approach that I was taught back in the 70s and very early 80s when at law school was everything was geared towards litigation. Um, and it's very different landscape now, and that's not the way in practice that we deal with it. 
So the reason I'm mentioning brainstorming in the context of this week's readings is to do with theories of law and justice. And that has changed over the last 30 years in that we now much more broadly consider different ways of implementing justice um, in the context of the theory of law in trying to resolve a dispute or advise a client about resolving the dispute. Uh, next week, we'll also talk about access to justice. So that works in with the theory of law and the brain ex exercise, brainstorming exercise in that um, not everyone has access to litigation at the high levels because of um, cost or, or um, ability to understand the process, etc. Okay, so are there any questions about what I've just said or anything that we've covered tonight or in your reading for this week? Or are there any, any questions about the toolkit, the second assessment? All good? I've got one question about the toolkit. Yes, Michael. How I've read it, could be so wrong here, um, is that it's basically about the whole process I'm doing in about analysing it. So you might be using a process of any sorts, you know, all the different what, tools like Iraq and whatever else ones there are, what you're going to do in there, how you're going to research, stuff like that, correct? Exactly. It's very broad. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's why I'm looking, I'm looking for you to think in much more broad terms Yes. Um, when you're preparing your toolkit and not be just too narrow in terms of your approach. No, that's a good question. Thank you, Michael. You're on the right track. Thanks. Are there any other questions about tonight's material, this week's reading, or the toolkit? Or, more, or anything at all, in fact? All good? Okay. All right, so we'll resume again next week. Your reading for next week is Chapter 12, Access to Justice. And um, uh, please keep asking questions or providing contributions through UCREW in the meantime. Otherwise, I'll end the meeting now. Um, and um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you next week. All the best. Okay, bye for now.